My name is Julie Pearson, Little Thunder. Today is Wednesday night, 2016, and I'm interviewing Tyra Shackelford for the Oklahoma Native Artist Project, sponsored by Oklahoma State University's Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. <laughs> We're at Tyra's home in Ada, Oklahoma. Tyra, you're a Chickasaw citizen, best known for your finger weaving. You do everything from traditional sashes to um, guitar straps. And you also work full-time for Chickasaw Nation. You've won a lot of awards for your art, and I'm looking forward to learning more about you and your work. Thanks. Where were you born and where did you grow up? Um, I was born in, in Oklahoma City, and then I grew up in Noble. I graduated high school from Purcell. I went to college here in Ada at East Central University and right after that started working for the Chickasaw Nation. Wow. Great job to get out of school. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what your mother and father do for a living. Both my parents are teachers. Uh, my dad teaches math and computer science. And my mom teaches chemistry and um, some other secondary sciences like physical science, environmental science, those sorts of things. How about brothers or sisters? I have one sister and she currently lives right outside of DC. Um, she hasn't been home for a long time now. <laughs> <laughs> Is she older sister? She's three years younger. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, now your father's uh, also an artist and well known for uh, do, work, doing a lot of different things. Can you describe sort of some of the things you were exposed to growing up in your household? Well growing up, is my dad when I was young, I was probably about mm, uh, 8 or 10, somewhere around there, we started getting involved with our culture. And the things I remember doing when I was little, we went to language classes, we went to Chick Chickasaw Community Council meetings um, in 98, so I was about 12, the Chickasaw Nation dance troupe started and we were going to stomp dances out at Coloma and we were going to do dance demonstrations with the dance troupe. And just been around that since I was young and that's how I started doing my finger weaving also is I wanted to make a belt to match my dress so I had to learn how to finger weave and right. <laughs> never stopped after that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, how about your relationship with your grandparents on either side? The Chickasaws on your dad's side? Yes. Yes. My family um, I would say being Chickasaw was not really passed down in my family much. And my original enrollee is my great grandma. And her mother was Chickasaw and her father was Choctaw. And she, um, her mother passed away when she was a year old. So she was raised by grandparents and I, I'm not sure if she was raised by her because um, her father was white also. I'm not sure if she was raised by her white grandparents or her mm -hmm. Indian grandparents. But my grandma said, when I asked my grandma about it, my grandma said, well, mama never talked about her family much. So I don't know what happened there. But my grandparents started getting interested uh, about the same time my dad did, I think. And they've been real involved with the Chickasaw Community Council in their area. And now they're involved with the, the senior site and elders activities and that sort of thing. Yes, and, and there's a lot of things to be involved with. So mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of good programs. Yes. What is your first memory then of seeing Native art? Hmm. Well, when I was a little kid, we used to go to Red Earth, and uh, my JOM organization 
would have a summer camp every summer and they would bring in artists and then usually it was the same time as Red Earth so we would go to Red Earth. So some of the artists that they brought in um, taught us traditional crafts and then I remember walking around all the artist booths at Red Earth when I was little. And then for a long time I didn't really think about native art um, after that. I think I was more focused on traditional crafts for a long time. And then when I met my husband, I knew how to do several traditional crafts. But he encouraged me to get involved in the arts because that's his background. And he, he just kept telling me that I could do so much more with what I knew how to do. So that's how I started getting involved in the arts again. Well, that's, that's pretty cool that you were being, like, individual artists were coming in and demonstrating and teaching you how to do things. But then you're kind of being led to make that connection between that and the markets as well because you're seeing those people mm -hmm. display and sell their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was good. Um, was that sort of an additional motivator? or? I don't think I thought about it until I had my husband's encouragement. I think I was I was just grown raised going to cultural resources activities. Cultural resources is a department within the Chickasaw Nation. So I was raised going to these activities and um, going out to the stomp dances. We had one big event every summer that was called Chikasha Reunion. Tons of demonstrators out there teaching crafts. So I think I always thought about the traditional crafts and I never thought how those could uh, expand into art or grow into art until my husband showed me that those things can be art. How about your first memories of making any type of art? The first thing I think I remember making, I don't remember what we did with JOM. <laughs> I was so little. I was like 10, 8, 9, 10, somewhere in there. The first thing I remember making was at Coloma, which is our stomp grounds, and it was during Chickasha reunion, and I learned how to make the beaded collars that are traditional for our regalia. And then after that, I learned how to finger weave, and... Um, and who taught you finger weaving? Well, this one lady, a, a few different women showed me some things, but... The main one was YZ, and I don't ever know if I say her last name correctly because I was little back then. It's Narcomy or Narcomy. Um, she's a Seminole elder, and she used to dance with us when I was little. And she's also one of the women that taught me how to shake shells. Oh, cool. Yeah. And she was a master. I haven't seen her in about five years, maybe. She was in her mid-80s the last time I saw her, but she was still finger weaving, which is amazing. But I think she's just one of the best. <laughs> one of the best to learn from. Were you always drawn to sort of three-dimensional from the time you were little? More, than, more so than drawing them? I think so. I think I don't have the patience for drawing or painting but when I'm creating something with my hands which I don't know you're you're creating things with your hands when you're drawing or painting but this is different when I'm making things um, I have the patience to do that so that's what I've always enjoyed but I think things like like basket weaving I know how to do, but it's not something I enjoy doing. Finger weaving is what I enjoy the most. Um, and beadwork I used to enjoy, but I haven't done it in probably about five or six years. <laughs> I haven't. It's not as fun as weaving. What did you enjoy about YZ's kind of teaching approach? Um... 
she would just sit down and kind of show you. And I don't know if there's any other way to approach teaching it. I think when I teach people, I think I teach them kind of the same way I was taught and just sit down and show and then just let them start doing it and then help them out while they're doing it if they make a mistake and need help fixing it or what. I think that's the best way to just go about doing it. So how about your exposure to um Anything in the public school, say at the elementary school level, in terms of art? I don't really remember. <laughs> remember anything. <laughs> um, how about junior high or high school? I remember we had to take art class in junior high. Um, but I don't remember much about it either. I remember we made loom beaded bracelets. That was about 7th or 8th grade. Then I didn't take an art class in high school. I did band and athletics and never fit that into my schedule. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you do after high school? I got a degree in chemistry. <laughs> From East Central University? Yes. And I've wow. never used it. <laughs> so you went into um, college interested in science already. Did you immediately declare a chemistry major? I started out thinking I would be a teacher like my parents. And so I signed up for the secondary education chemistry. And... Um, then when I saw all the education classes that were required, I changed my mind. <laughs> and so I got a degree in chemistry and a minor in math. And then after college, I, I graduated on a Saturday and Monday I already had a job lined up because my last semester I was looking for a job the whole last semester. Mm -hmm. But I immediately went to work in the Chickasaw Nation Cultural Resources department. Um, I knew that the tribe was working on the cultural center in Sulphur mm -hmm. and I knew uh, the director of the cultural resources department so I said when you start doing interviews I want to apply and um, that's how I got in. Is I think because I grew up around all those people involved in that department and they knew the knowledge that I grew up learning that helped me get that job and I worked there for oh gosh 2009 till spring of this year so about six years I worked in history and culture and cultural resources so what kinds of things were you doing I started out as a demonstrator at the cultural center and um, Mainly doing finger weaving? Or? We try to do something different every day. So I'm knowledgeable in, in many of our traditional crafts. I wouldn't say I'm a master in all of them, but I know how to do them. Um, and it was really good. I'm very thankful for that opportunity. And then uh, we would do dance demonstrations all the time and after a few years of doing that I moved up to special projects coordinator and started helping plan a lot of the events that we did and did that for a number of years and now I work in nutrition services which was another kind of promotion because now I have a manager position so it's a good thing. Congratulations. <laughs> So how did you meet your husband? Um, we were actually, I was on a date with someone and we went to the bar. <laughs> is this at East Central or? This is in Ada. In Ada. Mm-hmm. Um, and the date that I was uh, seeing 
was friends with James and he introduced me to James, my husband. And uh, it wasn't a serious thing, it was a very casual thing. And when I met James, I was like, he's really interesting. I need to get to know that guy. <laughs> because and, he was already working as a photographer a little or interested in photography. Well, he also worked for the Chickasaw Nation and he worked in Arts and Humanities. And um, I think our initial connection was talking about music interests, but we just got to know each other more and more. And he's just, he's really smart and well educated and um, involved in the arts and has a great work, that work ethic. And I just liked him a lot. I had to pursue him. <laughs> So you two get married and um, you're still doing your traditional work and you start a family and you're still working, correct? Well, our family's a little different because this is the, our third marriage for both of us. We've only been married three years. Um, we dated for two years before we got married, but our son is from my previous marriage and after we were married for a year James adopted our son um, and James is the only guy that our son knows <laughs> that's his dad because he doesn't know anyone else and then we had a baby she'll be a year old next week um, but so we started out not it's not a traditional situation <laughs> like the family. that's what a lot of them yeah um, you've kind of talked about that moment when um, that was kind of like a turning point for you and James said you really should think of your what you're doing which you were thinking of as traditional crafts more as part belonging to the arts mm -hmm. and, and it's true that's a distinction that you know sometimes native cultures don't draw those hard fast lines how did um, how did that work on you? How did his suggestion sort of open doors for you? I think because he was working for Arts and Humanities, um, he just kept telling me I could do more. And at the time I was making traditional belts for work and on the side for people that would just come ask me to make them a belt. A lot of commissions, I'm sure. Yes. Um, and he said, you can do more with this. You don't have to do just belts. You can think outside the box and you can do more. And he really encouraged me to enter Southeastern Art Show and Market, which is a show that the Chickasaw Nation does in Tishomingo in October. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and what year was this? 2011. And I can't remember without going back to look at my list of awards, but I won an award that year. For um, a... I, I think that one was a belt, mm -hmm. actually. But then the next year I did some belts and some shadow boxes. and. So you're putting the belts inside of a sh your shadow box? Well, I made that smaller... Okay. Smaller sections of weaving and, and framed them in a shadow box. I see. And he kept saying, you can do more than that. So then I started um, making some large pieces. And finger weaving is good for making narrow bands, but it's not good for making large pieces of fabric. There are easier ways to do that. But I was <laughs> determined. And I made... Um, this piece that was about this wide and I made it into a purse uh, and you're showing me probably about 12 inches there okay mm -hmm. so it was the whole front panel of a purse is what I wove as one solid piece um, and that one won a first place at CSAM and I think every year I've tried to do something different I made a large finger woven shawl I've expanded some of my techniques um, 
I still now it's it's not just finger weaving anymore I specialize in prehistoric techniques that my ancestors used so I do finger weaving I do twining and I do the technical term would be interlinking or intertwining but the more common term is spraying mm -hmm. S-P-R-A-N-G and with all of these techniques I'm trying to create things that are modern pieces for example twining traditionally was used to make skirts but they look very different from a skirt that I made two or three years ago which was twined mm -hmm. I made one and it, we used it for uh, Dynamic Women's Conference had a fashion show a couple years ago. Right. And so one of the girls wore that skirt. And it looked amazing, but it looked very modern. It didn't look like an uh, artifact from a couple thousand years ago. Um, so I try to use these, these three ancient, ancient techniques, and I try to create new things with them. And every year I'm doing something different and just trying to do more than what I did the year before. That's so, so interesting. Now, the, the twining, I've heard that used in connection with capes, of course, too. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really neat to hear about your skirt, and I hope we can maybe see a picture eventually or something. Um, I don't know if I have a picture, to be honest. <laughs> well, we'll see if we can work on that. Um, just... Thinking in terms of then some other shows, I know that you were using one of these techniques for at your first Indian market for your first entry. Is that correct? Can you? Uh, well, this year I entered a spraying cape that I created. This was my second year at Indian market. Okay. Uh, last year, I'm trying to think what I entered. I think I entered all finger woven pieces last year. And did you? Not last year. Okay. <laughs> Didn't place, but it, what was it like doing in Denmark for the first time? I was so excited to be there because it's, to me, it was an accomplishment just to get there. And um, it was a goal of mine, but I didn't think I would get reach that goal so quickly. I thought I would have to wait several years before I made it because several of my artist friends have always said, oh, well, you have to apply a few years before you get in, and uh, having a full-time job and having a family, I always struggled with building up inventory and doing more and more shows, and um, so, let's see. In 2014, I kept telling myself, Oh, when I retire. And then I did this workshop with uh, First Peoples Fund and Ryan Lee Smith, he's a Cherokee artist. He was one of the instructors for the workshop. And I said that in the class. I said, oh, when I retire, I can do this. <laughs> and he said, why not? Why can't you do it right now? And I would t list my normal excuses. I don't have time to make enough pieces. I don't have vacation time to go and he kept saying why not <laughs> and finally I was like you know what why not I'll try and then the very next year I got in um, so my first show was very exciting just to be there I was so excited and, and James then, did the whole family go with you well James went we both got in which was so surprising it was his first year so too. you shared the booth mm-hmm it was his first year to apply also, and we applied for Indian Market, and we also applied for the IFAM show, mm -hmm. uh, which it was the second year for IFAM. Right. And when I thought, well, maybe we'll get into one of them, and we got into both of them, so we had to operate two shows. <laughs> That's a real challenge. <laughs> it was, but we shared a booth at both shows, and... IFAM ran Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Indian Market ran Saturday, Sunday. So we were only separated the one day, meaning both booths. And I was pregnant at the time. Um, 
because that was in August and I was doing November. It was a lot of fun though. <laughs> um, so this year is when I won some awards at Indian Market. And that was, I was speechless. <laughs> well, tell us what you entered. And so I entered the spring cape and it was completely buffalo hair yarn and then it had a hand carved shell um, shawl pin on it and I do have pictures of Which, that one. Did you also make the? I didn't pin? make oh. it um, but that one won best of division and first place in its I can't remember category maybe mm -hmm. is right underneath division mm -hmm. Um, and then I also entered a finger woven shawl and that one got honorable mention and that one has a my dad carved a deer antler button for me on on that one um, so I was quite surprised at my second year there to win three awards right um, but very happy because there's not any work like what I'm creating at Indian Market. There's a lot of um, traditional Navajo rug weavers. Well, I say Navajo, but there are other tribes too. But traditional rug weaving, that's one whole category by itself. There's um, some fashion designers like I think Penny Singer was out there and B Yellowtail and um, I actually think I was competing against one of them and with my capes but there's not any anybody using the techniques that I'm using and there's not anyone creating pieces like what I'm creating and so it's really exciting to be be doing that right now <laughs> for sure did you sell both those pieces I still have the shawl but I sold the cape and I was very excited about that a very nice gentleman from Texas bought it for his wife um, so it was kind of bittersweet because I wanted to enter it in two more shows after that <laughs> but that's okay <laughs> How did you figure out when you made that transition <clears throat> from from doing things that <clears throat> you know you thought of more as traditional crafts into these traditional art applications? How did you know how to price your work? Before when I first started, I think I priced my pieces too low. I know I priced my pieces too low. Um, the workshop that I took with the, the First Peoples Fund, one of the things that they discuss in that workshop, because it's a artist, artist and business type mm -hmm. workshop, mm -hmm. um, but pricing your work was one of the topics we covered. And so I use a formula that I learned from that workshop to price my pieces, and I've been doing that for a couple years now. And it... I think it works. I think sometimes I still struggle because I feel like maybe I'm pricing my things too high, but I have to remind myself that what I'm creating takes hours and hours and um, it, it needs to be priced where it's at. I think where it's at is good. I just, I'm like, oh, I want someone to buy this. <laughs> Wow. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> when you um, started finger weaving, and there are some like mainstay patterns, I guess. What was what was the um, hardest pattern for you to learn? What was the most challenging? Mm. I think when I started adapting the basic patterns to create um, a really special piece. That was the hardest one. So for finger weaving, your basic patterns are like diagonal, chevron, lightning, um, 
diamond, arrowhead, and then you can get more complicated. You can get double lightning and different things. But I wanted to create a Chickasaw style, stomp dance style belt, kind of inspired by the Assumption sashes, um, which are, are different than the belts that we wear. Mm -hmm. um, but those Assumption sashes are very wide and they're made with a thread that's a lot thinner than ours and the pattern is like a double lightning only you have a whole bunch of lightning bands so I wanted to do that for a jigsaw belt so I created I call it my flame design and that was hard figuring out how to make it look the way I wanted it to and that's also the design that has taken the most time um, the first one I made my dad wears and I said never again am I making this belt <laughs> and then I did it again so yeah. I have one my dad has one and then one of our um, other stomp dancers has one that's not quite like mine and my dad's but it incorporates a little bit of that design into it and I keep saying never again but my son dances so I'll probably make him one, <laughs> and then when my daughter gets older, I'll probably make her one. <laughs> right. <laughs> you need to do that. Um, what's one of the best compliments you've ever gotten on your work? I think, let me think a second. That's a hard question to answer. I hear a lot of, oh, this is so beautiful. Um, I think, and it wasn't necessarily a specific compliment, but I think what helped me feel most validated in what I do is two years ago at Red Earth, um, my booth was next to a jeweler from New Mexico and I'm blanking on his last name. His first name is Jimmy. It's a, an, a father and son. Um, but at first they were just like, they didn't come out and say it, but I could tell from their body language and their expressions, what's this little white girl doing next to us? Uh, but then I set up my booth and um, I tend to take my weaving with me and work on it if it's slow. So one, the first morning I sat down and I was just weaving and then they started paying attention and the son he came over and he's like, that's how you do that. And then the, the next couple of days um, he just come ask me questions and he just found it really interesting because he had never seen anyone weave using finger weaving before. He was more familiar with the weaving that they have out mm -hmm. in New Mexico. Um, so that helped me feel validated. Like it helped me feel like I belong and what I'm doing is good. Um, because I do struggle with that sometimes. The you don't look Indian. Mm -hmm. But then also I think Chickasaw art's not known. Southeastern art's not known. The techniques that I'm using are not um, as common as other textile techniques. Um, yeah, that's been a challenge for Southeastern artists as well. Mm -hmm. Have you ever traveled out of state or had any work go out of state or out of the country? Uh, a few years ago, I had some pieces on loan for an exhibit that was a year long at the McKissick Museum. And now I'm blanking if it was North or South Carolina, to be honest. Um, I think they had three pieces for, for about a year, and then I got them back. And I've done shows. I did the Indian Market and IFAM in Santa Fe. Um, I had one piece actually 
Where did it go? It went to Africa somewhere. I have the gentleman's letter. I'll have to go back and find it now. He was actually going on a mission trip and um, he was Chickasaw. So he wanted traditional regalia to take with him and he was very interested in doing some um, like sharing of cultures and learning the culture where he was going and then also sharing our culture. Mm -hmm. So he ordered a belt and only I only had a week to make oh my it. Goodness. <laughs> I know. And then I I think when he went he left it out there with someone. He wrote a letter and I'll have to go back and find the letter. I'm pretty sure he left it in Africa, so I have a belt in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> um I have been accepted to an, a traveling exhibit that will be in 2018 it will be touring. We just, um, well just a few months ago they announced who was accepted into this exhibit and it's an exhibit comprised of only Chickasaw artists. Um, the purpose is to show Chickasaw contemporary art and we have a whole timeline um, so I have a little bit less than a year to create a piece for it and there's one piece I already have created that they are going to take um, and that's going to travel we don't even know all of the sites yet it will go to we know it will travel the country but they're also looking at traveling internationally so I'll keep my fingers crossed on that one. <laughs> yes, I hope that happens. So I know, I think I saw that there's a book that's just come out focused on Chickasaw women artisans. Mm -hmm. And you're in that book. Yes, I think there are 20 Chickasaw women in that book. And there's all sorts of different mediums. There's painting and beading and photography. And there's a couple of us in there for textiles. And Margaret Wheeler um, is one of them. She's kind of been my artist mentor. Okay. Uh, and then there's, I don't even remember what all mediums. Oh, there's pottery in that book. But I'm, I'm honored to be included in that. Um, that's been a work in progress for a few years now. And it's exciting to see it come to fruitation. And I had to go get all the other women to sign my book. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you worked with Margaret then at the Art Artesian Galleries? or? Well, I met Margaret um, before she went to the Artesian Gallery, and I've gone down there and visited her at the gallery also. But um, she's she's kind of been a mentor to me in the sense of growing as an artist and being involved in art shows and I have to like I just have to say that she hasn't been a mentor in the sense of weaving because mm -hmm. she does loom weaving and it's very different from the techniques that I'm using um, and some people will say she was my mentor in that, and it's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, I have tried to learn her style of weaving, and I've learned that I don't enjoy it as much. And she's tried to learn what I do, and I don't know if she enjoys it or not, but I think we both share research with each other um, because her work is very modern but she still takes inspiration from our history mm -hmm. and um, when I find things uh, I will email them to her or tell her about this book that I've been reading and she said she has a binder she'll print things off that I send her and she'll stick them in the binder and then she's had books that she's shown me and she's like you need to read this book and so I'll go get it and I'll read it. Um, 
and I think we admire each other's work very much because I own a few of her pieces and she owns a few of my pieces and I think I have looked up to her in that she's doing very contemporary things and I'm, I'm not sure if this is the right term for it. Like, some of her pieces are wearable art, but they are very much, they're not an everyday wearable thing. They're more kind of like an installation piece mm -hmm. that's very different. And so I take inspiration from that because I, this next year, want to do some things kind of in that direction. Um, I just want to elevate what I'm creating to another level. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I started branching out and doing more shows, because for the first year I only did Chickasaw Nation show, and then the second year I only did Chickasaw Nation show, but when I started adding shows, um, I would ask her for advice, or I would, she's the reason I wanted to go to Santa Fe. <laughs> Um, and then when I got into Santa Fe, of course, I had to, to ask her things like where to stay and what the schedule was like and how to set up a booth. And um, so she's been a wonderful, wonderful source for me and someone I really look up to. Well, talk a little bit, if you will, about that um, original... I guess it was the dynamic women fashion show because that was the first time I think you had a piece in there that was done as a fashion kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Chickasaw Nation does dynamic women's conference every year and I, I think it's in March or April every year and in um, the conference they have speakers and all sorts of different things breakout sessions but part of something that goes along with the conference is Art of the Chickasaw Woman exhibition or exhibit I'm not sure what the right use of that word is anyways um, and it's only Chickasaw artists Chickasaw women artists and our work is on display for about a month and I've done that for several years. Well, then a couple of years ago, they added a new element, and they've only done it, they only did it the one time, but it was a giant success when we did it, and it was a fashion show during the conference. And there were just a handful of us that showed our work in the fashion show. Margaret Wheeler was one, I was one, Maya Stewart was one, and I believe there was one other lady, and I cannot remember who it is. Um, but Myra Stewart does uh, handbags also. So Margaret had clothing items. I had a finger woven shawl. I had that twine skirt. And then I had some handbags. And then Myra, Myra Stewart had handbags in there. And it was, it was just gorgeous seeing the models wearing our pieces and showing off our pieces and I just loved every minute of it. I actually had to be a model in it also and I modeled one of Margaret's dresses and that was a gorgeous dress. Um, was that challenging? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not experienced with modeling, <laughs> but it was still a lot of fun. Um, and I would like to do, I would like for some more opportunities like that to come along. I don't think I'm at the level yet for uh, Indian Market Fashion Show, but I think in the future sometime I would like to get there. Um, and I say that right now, and I can hear Ryan Lee Smith's voice in my head saying, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'll happen sooner than I think. <laughs> well, um, talking about your purses, you know, you mentioned that that first competition piece was a woven, female woven purse with the front panel. But 
um, at this most recent Cherokee Art Market show I saw a lot of combining of the finger weaving and the leather, which I think is a great look. How did you come about? I did that to create pieces that were more affordable. <laughs> um, that's the other thing that I rely on my husband for is I want to make some pieces in the amount of time that goes into creating some of the pieces I want to make, it ends up being a very expensive piece. And so my husband has encouraged me to have a range of prices so I can reach more customers. And um, those handbags I started creating just so I could have some lower price points. And they're still, to me, they're still expensive, but then I think, oh, well, you spend several hundred dollars on a coach. It's okay. You can buy one of my bags. <laughs> right. Yeah, something really, truly unique. <laughs> yes. Um, but those are a lot of fun, and um, I'm still experimenting with that. Like, this one back here is, is a different shape mm -hmm. with the weaving. Right. So I have some more ideas for that. So are you buying, you're buying the purse first and then kind of, okay. I'm sewing it all. Oh, okay. I, I weave wow. the pieces and then I sew the whole bag and I do not have formal training in sewing. I had to teach myself, um, but it's been a fun experience. I can do, do one. Once I have all my weaving and all my pieces cut out, I can sew one up in a couple hours. Uh, the biggest time-consuming thing is the weaving. Right. And are you, you're not, you're doing a whole, in, the weaving is one organic piece in a particular shape or mm -hmm. you're not, or are you splitting up a piece of weaving? Well, after I, I did the one handbag that had the full front panel that was woven, I decided it was a lot um, less time consuming. I could save a lot more time if I just wove strips and then combine the strips. So some of my bags just have one, one strip across them. Uh, this one back here, that's actually like three or four strips that are combined together, but it looks really good. Yes. And then I have some more ideas for things like that. Well, you also um, had a, a finger woven guitar strap. Of course, beaded guitar straps have been around a while, but mm -hmm. how did you get that idea? My husband. <laughs> He said, you need to make some guitar straps, so I've made a few of them now. Have they sold for you? I, I've made four, and one I did a trade with another artist. Two I gave away to some guitar players because I wanted to make sure that they were practical. Mm -hmm. um, so Jeff Carpenter is in Ingenuity and he has one, and then Will Willis is in uh, Nishobolosa, and he has one, and I don't know how much Jeff has used his, but I know Will has not taken his office guitar since he got it, so he's been using it for a year. And I, I wanted them to give me feedback and tell me, yes, this is good, or no, it's not sturdy enough, and so far my feedback's been good. And then my last one just sold a couple of weeks ago um, to another guitar player. So I'm going to have to make some more. Right. Was that at the art market? Or? No, it sold uh, Chickasaw Nation, took a bunch of Chickasaw art to Mississippi, and they had a one-day festival in Mississippi. So I sent several pieces out there, and then that one sold out there. Great. How much of your work is currently commissions? Not much. I don't like to take commissions for a couple different reasons. Um, the one is the restraints on my time and making competition pieces for shows is kind of priority for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid if I start taking on commissions then that will get put to the back burner and I won't accomplish the things that I want to accomplish. Um, 
and then having a full-time job and having kids it's just hard to have time and then uh, another reason I don't like to take commissions is because I have all these ideas of things I want to create and if it's something that is not one of my ideas right now then I'm not as interested in completing it um, but sometimes I do take commissions and it's usually for people that I know on a personal level so if it's someone that I know uh, and they come to me and they ask me to make them a belt then usually I will say yes because I know them um, but there have been times where I've wanted to and I've been like I just don't have time and if you want to wait six months I can do it for you but if you want it right now you're gonna have to go ask someone else <laughs> and sometimes they'll wait and sometimes they'll ask someone else what do you think makes your finger weaving stand out maybe from others I think that I am the best that I have ever seen at finger weaving. <laughs> but really, I have been doing it, um, I'm 30 years old now, I was 12 when I started, so I've been doing it 18 years. And I, I don't think you have to be old to be a master at a craft. Um, and that, that's the technique I've definitely mastered. My tension is perfect. The materials that I use are expensive, quality, luxurious materials. I don't, uh, I'll work with acrylic yarns when people want me to, and normally stomp dancers, that's what they want. But when I'm creating things for art shows or for um, just exhibitions or just pieces that I want to create, I'm using mostly buffalo hair yarn or I'm experimenting with some other types of yarn that would be similar to traditional fibers. Um, I think I think when I look at some other finger weavers work I'm always kind of critical like their tension wasn't even or they weren't weaving tight enough or because in finger weaving it's called warp face weaving and you're supposed to only see your warp threads and not see that weft thread so if I see someone's weft thread then I'm like oh they could have done that better um I just think that I'm the best at it <laughs> <laughs> but you don't see many finger weavers at the shows that I go to there's a couple that are coming up and I am excited to see that um, it's I think a healthy competition because it makes me have to keep growing and keep getting better and better um, there's one lady that does finger weaving but she does the oblique style and she's very good um, and we compete in a couple of shows and I think it's kind of unfair to compare two different styles but she's pretty good at her her thing too. <laughs> <laughs> well this is a good segue into just um, maybe looking at your loom and just talking a little bit more about your processes and techniques so okay so we're looking at what you use for your finger weaving here here so this is a stand that I use. Um, it's very simple. When you do finger weaving, you don't have a loom. This is not a loom. This right. is simply an anchor. I will wrap my yarn around the stowel rod and then I'll do all the weaving out here by hand. This is great because I can use clamps and attach it to a table or I can take it with me in the car and I'll put my legs on the base here <laughs> to get that tension <laughs> yes um, so it's very portable and this is what I use 
most often now and I have used for a few years now. Before this, I did a number of different things. I would use the back of a chair. I liked using a step ladder because I could prop my feet up on the steps while I was working. Um, you can do finger weaving that anywhere. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's that suspension. You just need your... Mm -hmm. You just need something you can anchor your yarn to. Right. And then you're doing all the weaving yourself. Um, the other two techniques that I use are, are different with a spraying. I use a frame. And it's also not a loom. It's just... Like, think like a picture frame, only mm -hmm. the one I have is six feet tall and three feet wide. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then with twining... Would you want to explain uh, spraying a little bit more than before we move on? Like, okay. are you twisting the threads? What are you... Okay. How about I do all three techniques? So finger weaving... This, the type of finger weaving I do is warp face weaving. So you have all your warp threads and it's different from traditional weaving because in traditional weaving your warp threads tend to be stationary and you have a weft that goes back and forth. Um, with finger weaving your warp is not stationary. Your warp threads become your weft thread. They take turns changing with each other and that's how you can get the the various patterns that you get with finger weaving is mo manipulating mm -hmm. those changes. Um, spraying is your yarn is fixed at both ends and you only have warp threads and you do not have a weft thread at all. So what you're doing is twisting your threads around each other and your end product if you do it loosely, it's going to resemble a knotless net, or it's going to look kind of like uh, the netting on a hammock. Mm -hmm. um, but you can manipulate it also, so you can do it loosely and have that loose netting look. You can do it tight, and it's almost a solid piece of fabric. You can purposely weave holes into it to create designs and patterns. There's an absolutely gorgeous shirt that's in, um, I think it's in the University of Arizona right now, uh, but they call it Tonto shirt, and it's a couple thousand years old, and it's cotton, and it looks like lace work. Um, it just takes your breath away. It's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And then the third technique that I use is twining, and twining you have warp threads but then you have two weft threads and your weft threads you twist in between each of your warp threads um, and you can do you can manipulate that a lot to do a lot of different things with it also so in terms of some of the other you know you mentioned buffalo hair if you use that and some other non-traditional or traditional types of fiber how do you do they come in colors do you well, my buffalo hair, I, um, okay, let me start over. Several years ago, I went to Cahokia to learn from this woman um, on how to process my own fibers and spin my own yarn. And I learned how to spin it with a drop spindle because my idea was I wanted to harvest and process and dye and spin and create my whole own piece start to finish the way my ancestors would have done it. Well, I went, I learned a lot, and I also learned that I don't enjoy that part of uh, creating textiles as much as I enjoy the weaving. <laughs> so, um, my buffalo hair yarn I order from a couple in Texas. And they have the Buffalo Wool Company and they have several products available. A lot of their products are not 100% bison. Some of it's like bison merino, or I think they have one that's bison and silk. I usually do special orders with them to get 100% bison and get what the weight that I want because they do a lot of lace weights and I want more like a, a sport weight or a DK weight. Um, and then also dyes. I'll just 
tell them the colors that I'm wanting and they'll dye it for me. Um, some of the other things that I'm experimenting with right now is linen. I found this linen yarn and I've created one belt with it and I'm currently twining a bag with it and I chose that because my ancestors used um, nettle, stinging nettle and they're both bast fibers. When you spin nettle it spins just like flax does. We use flax to make linen so it was my cheating way of getting something like my ancestors. <laughs> But then I also have found some nettle um, and I've purchased it and um, I've got some plans for what I want to create with that and um, what other things do I like to use. Those are my main ones. The buffalo mm -hmm. is my main, main one, mm -hmm. but I'm open to trying some new things. So as you're doing your research, what, what are some of your sources for research? I have used a lot of historical texts. I've gone back and read several things from early contact time period. I read the DeSoto Chronicles, which they described some textiles, and that was the very first thing that was written down about Chickasaws, um, but then also several things from the 1700s. Um, I also study archaeological um, finds, research. There's uh, Penelope Droker has several things she's written where she's gone and studied textiles at various archaeological sites. And then Mary Spanos has some things um, that she's written also about archaeological pieces or like artifacts. Um, so I do a lot of reading those types of things also, but then one of the things that I try to do, and it annoys my husband, like Cahokia, I told him that was going to be a vacation for us, but then I went <laughs> and spent all day learning things instead of having a vacation, <laughs> and I've done that other times too. Um, I've gone to some other sites and tried to look at mm -hmm. pieces that they have. Because those first-hand encounters are really important for textiles. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some things that, like the threads that they were spinning were so fine, and then what they were weaving with those pieces, I just can't imagine how much time they would take. Um, because the, the threads that I like to work with are a little bit thicker than what my ancestors were using. Um, and partially, or part of that is I do that because it saves time. <laughs> um, when I made my large shawl, I used a very chunky yarn mm -hmm. because I knew it would take so much longer if I tried to use a worsted weight yarn. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, seeing those old, old pieces just makes me have a greater appreciation for what my ancestors were doing. Um, eventually I might try, <laughs> but not right now. So um, from the time you get an idea, how do you go about realizing it? Do you do any sketches or? I have a little notebook and I would say my drawing skills are not um, not very good. <laughs> I sometimes I'll try to sketch things out but I don't show anyone because it looks like a little kid drew it but it helps me remember whatever that idea was and then sometimes I'll have my husband draw things out for me like I'll describe what I'm wanting and he's better at drawing than I am um, so I have this new idea that I want to do and I just had him draw up what I'm wanting to do with it but um, 
some things I'll just start making immediately and some things I'll keep in my mind and I'll come back to them later when I can. Um, and some things I don't draw at all. I just have this picture in my head of what I want it to be when I'm finished. And I, I know how to accomplish that just because I know my technique so well. But let me say this. That spraying cape that won the award, that was one piece that I had this idea in my head. And then it did not come out. Finished product was not what I was picturing. And I was so disappointed. Like, I hated it. Um, I wouldn't show it to anyone for a year. I, I held on to it, and I thought about it, and I tried to re rework it a little bit, but I didn't do very much to it. And then I showed it the next year just because I felt like I was running out of pieces, and then everyone loved it. <laughs> So it's funny how things like that work out sometimes. <laughs> and you ended up winning awards. More and winning. <laughs> mm -hmm. When it started winning awards, I right. liked it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that piece too, I think seeing it on a person, because I had a couple models, um, so I could do a photo shoot with some of my pieces. Mm -hmm. And when I got to see it on a living person, I think is when I fell in love with it. That's different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what is your creative routine? Do you work after you come home from work or on weekends? How do you get your... Well, this year has been different because I have a baby. Before, uh, when my son was little, I would wait till he went to bed and I would leave in the evenings after he went to bed. Then when he got older, I could do more because he could go play or entertain himself or watch TV or whatever. So I could work after work in the evenings whenever I wanted to or on the weekends. Last year when I was pregnant, or not last year because Zora's almost a year old now. Um, so almost two years ago when I was pregnant, I did a lot of, if I wasn't at work, I was at home weaning. And I was doing that because I knew when she came along, I my time would be limited again. So I tried to create a lot of pieces. Um, now that she's here, I have only successfully completed one piece since she's been born. And she doesn't go to bed early yet. <laughs> um, but it's getting better. I have another piece in the works and I have to create a piece for that traveling exhibit and I need to create a few competition pieces for next year. So I'm going to have to work it out with my husband and just try to make some time where he can take the baby and I can do some work. It's difficult again. Um, and I just keep telling myself it'll get better. She'll get older and I can do more. <laughs> it will, it will. <laughs> well, um, you've just had this really remarkable, as you say, you've been doing this 18 years, but your art career has been much shorter. Mm -hmm. But even so, just looking back from this point, um, what do you think's been a kind of um, major fork in the road moment for you? Um, I think the first couple of years, I only did local shows, and I started out only doing Chickasaw shows, and then I branched out, but I only did local shows, and I think the fork in the road was getting into Indian Market and going to Santa Fe, and now I still have goals I want to do, um, I want to go to the herd. I want to go to Idle George. I want to go to uh, the Autry. Um, there's so many shows I want to do still. And um, I want to do some more exhibits. And I still think when I retire, but 
getting to Santa Fe. I think that's the fork in the road because I think it was the the point where it's like you don't have to wait till you retire. You can do these things now. I just got to find that good balance to balance family and work and art. And I'm lucky where I'm at in work. They're supportive of me and my art also. Um, so I very much appreciate that. My dream would to be able to do full art full time. Uh, but that's something I, I'm not sure I can do until I retire. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, is there anything else we've gotten to talk about that you want to add? Hmm. Um. I'm sure I, I will think of several things after we're finished. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look forward to yeah. seeing your this stuff that you have in progress for future shows yeah um i think i do want to say the right now where my passion lies is in these these ancient prehistoric techniques um i, I want to do more also with teaching those things because i don't want them to die out i try to use my art and create new modern things with it because I want to inspire others to learn these techniques and show them that they can make their own things. Um, and even though I'm creating new modern things that you haven't seen before, with these techniques I still very much take my inspiration from those old, old pieces that my ancestors were creating. <laughs> Uh, I think that's what I try to always keep in the forefront of my mind in everything that I'm doing and that's like my personal mission is is to keep those things alive and create inspiration for others with what I'm doing well thank you very much <laughs> for your time today Tyra thanks I'm so glad you came down <laughs> <laughs>